So we've got two fantastic speakers. We've got Ian Diamond and Sharon Peacock. So I'll introduce them very briefly. So uh, Sir Ian Diamond is the national statistician. And can I say that he's 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 given up his time. He's on holiday in the Isle of Skye to present to you today. So a remarkable contribution. It's the hottest day of the year there. It's 12 degrees. So that's why he's got his woolly on. Um, but but Ian has has led the uh, uh, the uh, surveillance of uh, COVID through the ONS. It's been a privilege to work with ONS in very close partnership. So Ian, surveillance overview, over to you. Very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, and as well as it being less than 12 degrees, um, the midges are biting hard. So if I go like that, uh, it is nothing to do with uh, my presentation. It is solely that I've been bitten by a midge. Um, look, I just want to say a few words about uh, public health uh, surveillance um, or, or, or of the virus over the next over the last year or so. And just to say across the UK, this has been an incredible team effort. Um, and uh, I just want to point uh, to three areas. Firstly, the, the various public health organisations uh, and, and their testing, whether it's in England, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland, have been, I think, absolutely outstanding uh, and have uh, really stepped up to the mark in getting high class data at pace and available uh, for uh, secondary analysis uh, and, and indeed uh, for, for our understanding uh, of trends. But at the same time, we identified in April 2020 that it was going to be incredibly important to have um, asymptomatic testing uh, and to get some, 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 if you like, community work going. Uh, and there have been two uh, main studies, I would suggest, um, uh, and um, one run by Imperial College, the REACT study, I think is absolutely fantastic, um, not just in terms of the results, but I was sampled in one of their samples and I have to say the respondent experience was completely exemplary uh, and the react do a random sample of around 100,000 people uh, on a regular basis and then uh, produce uh, estimates um, and uh, I do think do do that incredibly well next slide please um, and then the ONS uh, study uh, and what we what we do uh, is have a longitudinal element uh, and uh, we have a sample of around 150,000 um, swabs uh, every fortnight and then a um, very large number of, of blood tests uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the slide just shows uh, the estimates for, for England, Wales, Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, but the sample size does enable uh, regional estimates uh, and also estimates by various um, area, areas of, of disadvantage. I think it's really important that that enables us to to estimate the prevalence at time and to do so at pace. Um, the ONS study uh, reporting every Friday uh, and some of the, the trends uh, have been, I think, quite important in um, informing uh, policy. And if you just look for England, uh, you can see um, the impact uh, in late 2020 of um, first um, the November uh, restrictions uh, and then the increase uh, as the, the new um, variant took place uh, and then the new restrictions coming on the 2nd of January and so um, you really have been able to to monitor trends at pace. Next slide please. Uh, at the same time um, the blood tests have allowed us really to look very carefully um, at the relationship between uh, the UK's fantastic uh, vaccination program uh, and antibodies. The, the slides on the right again for England, Wales, Scotland and Northern, Northern Ireland just show uh, over uh, the period of 2021 uh, that the, the um, green line is proportion of people or, or those people reporting one uh, vaccination. The, the light blue is two vaccination um, jabs uh, and then the other is antibodies and um, the association is uh, very, very clear. Um, next slide, please. Um, and also, we've been able to, and again, react and ourselves. And I think one of the beauties of this is the fact that the triangulation between different studies has been incredibly impressive. And what we have been able to do 
is to show uh, the impact uh, dependent on various um, uh, combinations of either different vaccines or numbers of um, whether you have the first dose or the second dose uh, relative uh, to um, not having vaccine uh, of, of the probability uh, of um, catching uh, the virus and what you see is a remarkable reduction and therefore being able to test the success uh, of uh, the vaccine uh, really in the community and I think that's been important I mean vaccines brilliantly uh, put together in labs but actually being able to test them in the community as well incredibly important next slide please um, and um, I also then want to move on um, if you like surveillance of, of the vaccine just to say that uh, although I won't show any slides uh, we have also been doing a weekly opinion uh, survey to uh, understand um, social issues to understand how people are finding anxiety depression to understand uh, the impact on long COVID uh, the impact of restrictions the use of face masks I could go on and on and on uh, and that is a survey uh, which goes out on a Wednesday, every Monday, it stops at 4 a.m., we publish at midday, uh, and um, it is enabling us at pace to be able to understand how people are, are thinking uh, about uh, the various impacts that they have. But it is not only through direct data recording that we've been able to understand uh, what has been going on, being able to link data uh, again, at pace has been incredibly helpful. So if we are interested in looking at inequalities, uh, we've been able to do that, uh, for example, uh, through linking um, the data on vaccines with census data. And that's enabled us to show, for example, in this slide, uh, that there is greater vaccine hesitancy uh, amongst uh, some people uh, of various uh, ethnic uh, groups as opposed to uh, others. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and next slide, please, again. Um, and next slide, please, again. Great, thank you. Um, and it's not only through looking at inequalities, and one of the work we were able to do through all that linking was really to look at the dreadful uh, inequities that some uh, ethnic groups had over others and how that changed uh, over uh, time. And I have to say, in different ways, I have to say that it is not just ONS. I mean, the, the beauty of what we have enjoyed the privilege of doing over the last year is working in real um, harmony with fantastic scholars from right across um, the United Kingdom and indeed beyond uh, these nations. Uh, and we do that, um, for example, on, on um, on ethnicity with uh, Kamlesh Kunti and his team at Leicester as well, uh, and also with, um, for example, Sarah Walker and her team uh, at Oxford University. Uh, and we have also been able increasingly to look at other areas. For example, this slide just shows some things on international arrivals, uh, and we are taking our, our regular international passenger survey now to understand uh, the experience of international arrivals uh, and also to link that to those places that we know over the last four to five years have high levels of movement between the UK, often for people visiting relatives. Higher education has been an important area to look at in uh, the UK. A big outbreaks last October uh, and we have done a lot of work both looking at behavioural aspects amongst students in higher education, uh, as well as being able to monitor uh, trends. And then the final thing that I just wanted to say, Andrew, if I may, is the fact that I think it is also incredibly important to look at the economy uh, at time. Uh, and one of the things that National Statistics Institutes do quite well is to look at how the economy has been going. Uh, and what we've been able to do in the UK uh, over this period is really to pivot to be able to do things at great pace using novel and uh, radical data sources, for example, uh, web scraping on vacancy data to find out almost in real time uh, how vacancies are going or using um, 
or, or using um, Google data in order to understand movement and mobility uh, during restrictions or, or using uh, financial transaction data to understand spending of the consumer and how that is changing over time. And so, Andrew, in finality, I think we've been an enormously successful partnership between scientists right across the United Kingdom to be able to get surveillance not only of the vaccine, but of its impact on the lives of citizens right across the UK and on the economy. And to do that in a way which working with HDI UK, which has been an absolute privilege, uh, enables us to um, get those data out to people again right across the research community for secondary analysis seems to me to have been enormously successful. Thank you so much. Um, who is the um, director of the Genomics UK Consortium uh, and Professor of Public Health and Microbiology at Cambridge. Sharon, thank you for everything you've been doing the, during the pandemic. And you're going to tell us about 561,000 viral genomes. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I won't be doing it one at a time, so it won't take too long. Uh, first thing to say, Ian, um, it's 16 degrees and sunny in Cambridge, so I'm sorry to tell you that, but I suspect that the view out of your window is probably better than mine. Um, uh, the second thing I would reiterate is really how incredible the team science has been in the UK over the last 18 months or so. I'd just like to echo what Ian has said. It's been a real privilege to be part of that, and I very much hope that um, going forward that that kind of unity across the scientific community across different disciplines continues uh, to, to strengthen uh, further and i think meetings like this actually help that so thank you to hdr uk for organizing this important meeting i'm going to be talking today about how we can improve health through enhanced data linkage to our uk sars-cov-2 genomes next slide please now Genome sequencing the virus really has become a vital part of our pandemic response. And we need to provide actual inform actionable information. Um, and I've listed some of the things that we use the information for. So we need to reveal the patterns of viral introduction, for example, into the UK, and then onward transmission through community spread and hospital spread. We need to detect when variants of concern and, and variants of interest actually emerge. And then we need to map them to look at the distribution of variants and that strongly informs policy and interventions. But we also need to monitor the effectiveness of vaccines um, and other interventions. We've seen that particularly recently with the Delta variant. And we need to use the genome data to then go back and develop new diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics that actually keep pace with the, the speed of viral evolution. Next slide, please. So the generation of genomes in the UK has been made possible by the creation of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, which was built from scratch uh, and was an idea generated in March 2020 when there were less than 100 diagnosed cases of COVID-19 uh, in the UK. And so we started in April 2020, we established a distributed model of sequencing by bringing together 16 academic institutions across the country uh, the Wellcome Sang Institute and the four public health agencies of the UK. The four nation working was extremely important um, uh, to our principles. And we then networked that with more than 100 NHS diagnostic labs based in hospitals and together with the high throughput lighthouse labs that were doing the community testing. So that's, um, that's a, a quite a, a challenge and the necessary <clears throat> administrative and ethical frameworks were really developed by a team in Cambridge, where the logistics and ops teams are also based. So we had very generous access to the UK cloud infrastructure for microbial bioinformatics, it's a bit of a mouthful, but we call that CLIME, to house a custom data management system. And I think that this was one of the key uh, elements to our rapid success when we first got going. Next slide, please. Now, COG UK has four main objectives, which you can see on the left in the circle. When we started, our first uh, and foremost aim was to generate data for public health agencies so that they could uh, take action on the basis of th their findings. But we are primarily a research network and have undertaken really extensive research and development to improve sequencing efficiency and cost. 
We've developed tools that help to quickly analyze genome data in an automated way. And we've also undertaken a basic research on viral evolution and transmission. Our other aims are to become increasingly integrated across the UK science ecosystem. I'll talk about that in a, a bit more in, in a moment. And we're also supporting international sequencing efforts. So we have now generated over half a million SARS-CoV-2 genomes. That's around 10% of diagnosed cases in the UK overall since the start of the pandemic. And the sequencing capacity is divided into three different categories. Uh, the largest category is random community and hospital surveillance. So we have a, a good idea of what's emerging and what's uh, being spread in the community. But we also use our sequencing to target uh, public health actions. And we also support several key national studies. So our data has revealed patterns of viral introductions into the UK since the start of the pandemic. That's been very important to our UK border force. They've been used to investigate transmission and outbreaks in places such as care homes, prisons, universities and workplaces. And genome data are actually used daily to enhance contact tracing and surge testing. And we also sequence the virus in people infected for a second time or after vaccination to look for variants associated with immune escape. So COG data was used to detect the alpha variant in the UK and sequencing has since been used to detect many other variants of concern and interest, including the Delta variant. Now we provide sequencing to uh, several national studies, including uh, the ONS study and REACT. And we're very fortunate to be able to uh, uh, support colleagues uh, through genome sequencing. It's been a pleasure to do that. Just to note that all genome data are released into global public databases for other people to use, um, and so they can be used all over again. Next slide, please. So our first 18 months have really been focused on generating genomes for public health action and analyses, but looking ahead, we're now refocusing our efforts in new areas. This includes the development of COG International, uh, which will develop online courses, uh, train the trainer courses and virtual classrooms in SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, passing on the knowledge that we've gained in the last 18 month. month. But what I want to focus on here is our work to facilitate data linkage across the science ecosystem, which is being kick-started using seed funding from our original COG grant, but we hope will be followed by further funding. Next slide, please. So at the moment, we already link sequence data with sample data, which is uploaded into the, uh, the, the CLIMB cloud infrastructure. It then becomes linked to NHS numbers by Public Health England. But we're now in the process of migrating these data sets through into UK trusted research environments, where we're going to link this to detailed demographic data, electronic health records and host genetic information. Next slide, please. So by combining viral mutations with host genomes, uh, immune status, physiological measurements such as uh, blood pressure and so on, treatment of patients and comorbidities, what we aim to do is discover new information on the determinants of COVID-19 susceptibility and outcome from infection. So in moving from a, a generation of, of, of sequence data for public health action, which would be taken up now by Public Health England into a discovery phase, uh, with this fantastic data sets that we've generated. So really, in summary, these genomes have been put to good use the first time round for public health benefit. And now we're going to go to a brand new level of analysis in support of discovery science. So thank you for listening. But before I close, I do want to acknowledge that around 500 people are members of this consortium and they've contributed to the efforts of COG UK. Many are working as volunteers and have put their own work to one side to do that. And so my grateful thanks go to every member of the consortium. Thank you. Sharon, absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Ian, so we've got time for one or two questions, if, if that's OK, if that's agreeable with you. Um, we have, Ian, one for you, one from Gila Nazari. Um, how are we doing with standardization of how COVID-19 data are collected around the world and, and what, uh, what role is the UK playing in that? So. Well, thanks very much for the, the opportunity. I think, I think the answer, to be absolutely honest, is mixed. Uh, I think WHO did a fantastic job uh, right at the beginning so that we have standard definitions um, 
uh, that are available around, for example, COVID mortality, although different places are, are reporting them uh, sometimes in different ways. I think that there hasn't been, in my view, enough uh, work um, on standardization across questions like uh, vaccine efficacy. Uh, I don't think there's been quite enough uh, work uh, around uh, standardization uh, of work around prevalence. And I do think there should be more uh, studies like those of the REACT and, in, and ONS in the UK, which really enable us to understand the asymptomatic uh, position. So uh, I think there's been some great things and I think we should a uh, big shout out for WHO for their speed last year in, 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 in pushing things forward. But I think there's an enormous amount more for us to do. And I do think there is an enormous opportunity for sharing data internationally uh, in a way which will enable us better to understand the epidemiology of this awful disease. Right. OK. Um, and I've now got a question for you, Sharon, from Robert Terry. Um, uh, so, so Robert says that you know genoma, sharing of genomic sequence data is probably the most advanced and a gold standard. However, at the same time, colleagues in low middle income countries feel that perhaps it's uh, uh, free trade rather than fair trade. And there's um, inequity in terms of the, the, the benefits which are derived from data sharing. So, Robert's asking, how, how, as this is a global challenge, how do we address those inequalities? Tricky question. <laughs> yeah, I, in, in many ways, uh, well, thank you, Robert, for that really vital question, actually. It's one of the most important questions for me today. And in many ways, it's not tricky, uh, because I think that, that sharing uh, capabilities for sequencing starts with, with training and being able to help people to uh, um, undertake sequencing in their own country. One of the reasons that COG UK have now developed into a, a separate arm of COG International is because we do want to get free online courses to people that can explain how to do sequencing and why it's necessary. And also followed up with train the trainer courses and virtual classrooms because training absolutely underpins inequity of sequencing. But we've also got other issues to actually focus on, including uh, supply chains, um, getting uh, uh, consumables into countries, and of course, um, uh, funding of equipment and consumables. And so uh, this is uh, another area that's being discussed a great deal at the moment, and, and WHO are clearly going to have a very big a role in that. So I think there needs to be a big push to get sequencing rolled out across the world so there isn't uh, an, uh, an inequity. And in many ways, we focused on COVAX, but actually COGEN, you know, the sequencing, is an absolutely parallel activity because unless you know what's circulating in your country, you can't be certain that the vaccine you're rolling out is going to be as effective as you hope. So uh, for me, there's also another piece around um, you, you know, uploading data so that it's freely available. Now, open access is a, is a great ideal, but it can be um, exploited by people who think that they can take that data and analyze it um, for themselves, rather than attributing the people that, that actually put that data there in the first place. Now, there are uh, rules that, that try and prevent that happening, for example, in, in Gizaid. Uh, there's, also, there's always going to be the potential for people to ignore those rules. But I hope that given that you know, we're all in this together, uh, that people would be uh, uh, reasonable in their use of data that is open access. So I think to summarise, it's beholden on everybody who's got expertise in sequencing, uh, in uh, informatics analysis and so on, to support the people that, that don't so that we can actually start to get kind of more of a level playing field um, in this area. Thanks. OK, no, great. Um, uh, uh, you know, great. Great response. Now, we're running short of time. We've got one final question from uh, Matt Thacker, which is, um, uh, well, to both of you, what can we learn from the ONS uh, survey and COG UK about bringing these uh, research methodologies into routine care in preparation for the next pandemic? So what have we learned from COG UK uh, and how we would take sequencing into routine care? And, and what have we learned from the CIS in terms of having 
uh, reliable and resilient surveillance that we can just turn on when when it's required. That's from Matt Thacker. Shall we, shall we start with Ian? Well, thanks very much, uh, Matt, for that question. And I have to say, um, what I think we have learned is the real importance of having an infrastructure to uh, be able to step up at real pace um, the analyses that are needed. I mean, we took the CIS from a, if you like, phone call of this is what's needed to being in the field with all the ethics and all everything else in one week. I think that really shows what can be done, but it could have been done even faster if we've had that infrastructure over time. And I do think uh, what we've learned is that it is not just the simple question, in this case, the simple but incredibly important question of what is the prevalence that you get from having that long-term system. Uh, it is also your know, questions, for example, around long COVID, for example, questions around antibodies, for example, questions about the impact of restrictions, the impact on employment. Your big, big questions. And I just think uh, that what we've learned is that there are enormous benefits uh, for a long-term infrastructure, which is looking uh, at public health uh, across countries in a longitudinal way, uh, and which is joined up uh, yeah. across all arms of, of government, health service, um, public health uh, and everything. And I just think that also enabling those data very quickly to be available for analysis and to be able to link, to be linked to other uh, data sets very, very quickly, for example, those from hospital records um, has been incredibly important. And it seems to me uh, that we in the UK have an opportunity uh, to really improve um, our understanding uh, of public health issues and to be ready at pace to respond to all kinds of issues uh, when needed. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sharon, we've probably got 10 seconds, I'm afraid. So one thing okay, like to... uh, I, I, sh I shall give it a go. Um, uh, the genie's out of the bottle. We're no, not going back to not using sequencing and routine care anymore. We just have to do it. We need to have it close to the patient. And in order to have uh, close sequencing to the patient, we need technological advances in terms of automated data analysis and like a black box solution for people. So you can squirt your sample in at one end and you get an answer that clinicians and other people can understand and, and can put into action at the other. So there's some more work to do, but we're not, we're not gonna go backwards. I hope we're only gonna move forwards. Fantastic. The genie is out of the bottle. What a great message to end this first session. So can well, I thank, well, thank Sharon, thank Ian, um, thank Margaret, Maria and Debbie. And now it's time to jump to the parallel sessions. Enjoy. And thank you, everyone on this fantastic panel.